I helped lead a political campaign to victory using tactics I now regret. I didn't do anything criminal and not anything even remotely illegal. And I helped elect someone I really believed in, a true progressive. He voted against the Iraq war, advocated for single payer health care, helped the disenfranchised. The year was 1996 and I was a recent law graduate hungry to make a difference. In fact, at my law school graduation, when the photographer arrived to take the class picture, he asked the class to smile by saying, money, and they obliged. Instead, I threw my fist in the air and said, justice. Yeah. And now here I was, campaign manager for a US congressman in the toughest re-election campaign of his political career. Our opponent was a young, smart dynamo, moderately conservative female state senator who would give us a run for our money. And you know the challenge with winning elections, right? Elections are not won by the ideologies of either side. They're won by the people in the middle, the undecideds. And it's the candidate who can persuade more of those undecideds to break to their team who wins. Most of a general election is about messaging to the undecideds. So I guess it's no wonder that I didn't speak up when a consultant to the campaign suggested that our tagline be, working people first. What does that even mean? <laughs> and I guess it's no wonder that I helped develop a negative TV ad that morphed the image of our opponent into the image of Newt Gingrich. Now we wanted to make the case that a vote for her was a vote for the Gingrich agenda. And there is some truth to that but to morph her image into his, to depict them as one and the same, was just not true. But that didn't dawn on me at all at the time. I remember pretty vividly sitting in that studio with the ad team. Some recent polling had just come out. Our lead had narrowed. She had a real shot, and all I could think of is, we need to go big, we need to go negative. I remember sifting through photos of her until we could find the most unflattering one and then manipulating that photo even more until it was more unflattering. You've seen these ads. I'm not here for absolution. Rather, I'm here to explore how the sting of these early ethical transgressions help form and sustain for me a personal moral compass that I've come to rely on for the rest of a career in public policy. It was actually these early missteps that helped me grow a commitment to elevate the debate. I know we all have it, that voice, that personal inner ethicist, but it's our institutions, it would seem, that drown out this voice until we no longer hear it, and then we no longer trust it. These are our institutions that drive home our duties to our shareholders, that celebrate our profit motive, that push political campaigns to the edge of truth, and then reward viral tweets when they have gone too far. Have we tired yet of this hyperbolic state of affairs? And where do we even begin to restore the ethical health of our institutions? Well, I submit that we can start by changing the way we've been debating public policy. Our level of political debate has eroded, and I think it would even shock our framers. They understood the tensions between the branches of government. They created them by design, of course. They understood the tensions between individual rights, states' rights, and the federal government. They certainly understood the challenges of taxation and the need to promote interstate and international commerce. And while we may think that our issues of today are so much more complex, our political parties are organized around the same contest of ideas. Perhaps it's time to remind each other that it's not only okay to disagree, but it's essential to the health of our democracy to disagree. But let's look at the typical debate of today. To do so, I'm gonna propose some fictional legislation, and I'm gonna call my legislation Shoes for Schools. This bill proposes using federal education funding to provide a stipend for low-income families who are struggling with back-to-school expenses like shoes. Our hope is that by providing this stipend, students from low-income families will improve school attendance and thereby school performance. So in the typical debate of today, a typical response to a proposal like Shoes for Schools looks like this. Party A responds with, you're a wasteful spender, right? And then Party B responds with, 
if you don't like this program, then you hate the poor. In my, av in my job as an advocate for issues that affect low-income populations, I see this debate play out again and again. You're a wasteful spender. You're a hater. <laughs> and sometimes this debate is disguised a little, so one side says, you're a wasteful spender because data point, data point, data point, and the other side says, you're a hater because data point, data point, data point, but we're still back to name calling with data points. But what if we really valued that contest of ideas? What if we were careful with language and claims of urgency? What if our debate looked more like this? What if party A said, yes, we have low-income families who struggle, but a costly federal government program is not the way to go. Instead, we should provide market incentives and meet families' needs at the local level. What if Party B said, okay, government can be costly, and market incentives do work, but they can be uneven, and region by region they could be different, and they don't protect families against discrimination. So let's have a comprehensive federal program that ensures fairness. Now, how much harder was it to have that kind of debate? You know, clearly not that hard. To take this even further, the superficiality of our current debate is creating an informational void, and it's also creating some organizational chaos. The new generation of the party faithful may not understand right now what they're supposed to be faithful to. What I like about the yes, but instead model is particularly the yes portion. Yes, government can be costly. Yes, low-income families struggle. This is the counter argument, right? This strategy that many of us learned in high school debate club is now frighteningly absent from state houses and in Congress. It's as if our current desire to never show weakness is actually undermining our ability to problem solve as a society. Progressive friends, I think it's time for us to admit that sometimes government can be really expensive and inefficient. It's gonna be okay. <laughs> Conservative friends, I think it's time to recognize that we have a lot of economic disparity in this country, and there are a lot of low-income families who struggle and can't afford basic needs like shoes. After all, if we're not willing to name the problems of government, how are we ever going to improve it? And if we're not gonna name the fact that we have low-income families who are struggling, how are we ever going to address their disadvantage? So I'm proposing a pipe dream. No, I don't think so. I think this is what democracy is designed to do. Instead, let's take a pledge to elevate the debate. Imagine if we asked every candidate for public office, will you elevate the debate? Could we have progressive candidates that talked about the challenges of government and pledged to improve it? Could we have conservative candidates that talked about the challenges of an unregulated free market but still pledge to, res to support responsible business. As we grow hungrier for a more ethical body politic, so will our commitment to participate more thoughtfully. I can envision a day where I would be asked to speak to the merits of a program like Shoes for Schools, and if that day comes, I promise to do the best job I can, make the best arguments available, and get some good data to back it up but I am also prepared to lose. The other side has a valid point of view and it's by respecting that point of view that I'm inspired to be more on my toes. I'm inspired to be a better advocate and I'm inspired to elevate the debate. I would like to believe that we would have won that 96 race without the silly tagline or the negative TV ad. I'll never know. But I do hope that the next generation of hungry idealists will take the necessary steps to recalibrate our institutions, restore meaning, and save democracy. Thank you.